Welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. So before we kind of get into some of the specifics around reducing complexity and this whole new notion of response lifelines, which some of our folks have started to learn about today, I was hoping that um, we could kind of get into your, your role and your journey that has led you um, into FEMA's Office of Response and Recovery. And you've walked a unique path in supporting public safety, but also in the policy space. So, you know, kind of what brought you into this field? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a real yeah. pleasure. Uh, last year was great, and uh, you guys have been instrumental and extremely helpful to us. Uh, thank you for everything you've been doing for us during disasters. Um, and so I started off, most people start off at the operational level and move up, and I went from the policy level and moved down to operations as much as possible. Uh, do we have any emergency managers here? I mean, it's a tremendous, tremendous mission. I started off uh, coordinating the Congressional Fire Service Caucus on the Hill, doing all the fire legislation, and then 9-11 happened. And the next thing you know, I'm in the Homeland Security Committee, and we're writing all the legislation on the Homeland Security Act and the HERO Act with 24 megahertz of spectrum and 700 megahertz. Uh, and you just kind of gravitate to that. And uh, having those, you know, coordinated across the missions and disciplines just, you know, there's pulls you to that, that operational role, and I, and I just love it. It's, you know, you know, I, I wish everyone could have the same value and mission and purpose in the morning when they wake up as emergency managers do. And it's a tremendous mission, tremendous people. You know, they only get called upon when it's crisis and everything's going bad and everyone's mad and angry. And uh, all the sectors are, are, are falling up, are, 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 you know, the interdependencies are, are, are falling upon each other and, and failing. And that's where emergency management, that's their sweet spot. That's, their, that's what they align. You know, you don't need, Emergency management, you don't need emergency management for firefighters to put out fires. You don't need emergency management for police to do their job. But you need emergency management to address critical interdependencies across multiple sectors, uh, failures across multiple sectors, multiple disciplines and functions, and that's where we shine. And, and that's, just, that's just a rarity. And, and so gravitate to that purpose and uh, coming to FEMA was, uh, was a no-brainer. You also have had an interesting role in the field of technology within public safety and emergency management and policy. Um, and obviously, technology has changed and evolved quite a bit, but can you put your finger on one particular experience, was it in a disaster or in an, a work in an exercise or planning, that got you kind of hooked on the power of geospatial? Yeah, I've talked about this before, but it definitely, definitely the 2016 Louisiana floods was, to me, the, the kicker. Uh, we had, you know, we had this major flood in a rural area, and we didn't have a lot of gauges in that area. We didn't have a lot of technology. We didn't have a lot of visibility. Uh, it was not a very data-enabled uh, geographic construct. And we're responding, and we're, we, we have the National Response Coordination Center up, and we're responding as if it's a 35,000 home disaster. That was based upon the latest NOAA reports and imagery. Uh, but then we, you know, we, some of you are here have been helped, helped us with this, but we, we developed depth grids, and we, 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 we extrapolated the, the, the depths between different gauges and, and estimated where, uh, where's the extent of this flood may go and overlay that over, uh, overlay to, that over building outlines. And I remember that the, the, in the operations room and we're all talking about each other, like what, how bad is this? How bad, you know, we know it's bad, but we can't tell. And everyone's frustrated and we stand up and we say, uh, sir, I think it's 155,000 homes. And everyone was just floored, floored. Uh, like, what, are you crazy? Where are you getting this from? There's no official report that says this. We've not done preliminary damage assessments yet. We've not been on the ground. Nobody knows. How, the gall of you to say that we have 155,000 uh, homes uh, impacted. And we said, no, nope, this is what it is. We explained it. But in emergency management in good form, you know, took that in. It took a couple of minutes to assimilate that and assess that and, and then moved on and completely pivoted the scope and scale and posture for that disaster from a 35,000 home event to 155,000 home events. And our logistics construct, the establishment of incident strategic bases, our movement of commodities, the ordering of, of, uh, of, of resources, uh, the mission assignment process, our tempo completely changed within minutes. And it was it transformed that incident. And it was because of the work that the geospatial community and data uh, integration community has, had done. And that's where we, we had, I got it going through that process, but it all, I got it by having to teach and explain and interpret that, what the, you guys have been doing for, for decades and to a, to a, to a lesser educated uh, audience. And we were, we were right, you know, that, that number was right. And we advanced the ball 
days, if not a week, uh, for our operational posture. And uh, we, we probably did a lot of good for that. And that expediting that process is pretty impactful. I want to come back to this because you raised, you know, that difference between a 35,000 home event versus 155 and understanding the, the confidence level in that information. But um, before we dive into that, uh, I would like to talk about geo-enabling the planning process. This morning, uh, we had the director of the city and county of Boulder's OEM talk a bit about their emergency operations plans and how they're looking and how they are currently geo-enabling both the EOPs as well as the crisis action plans. And I know this is an issue that's near and dear to the work that you did in your previous role and obviously in your current role. Um, and how did you get started on this mission of geo-enabling the planning process? You know, the, with any reorganization, you know, we all get reorganized and uh, we were going through a realignment and uh, we were, I, I was in charge of the planning shop and I, I got introduced in the room and said, Greg, congratulations, you're now in charge of GIS too. And uh, I was really nervous because it's always a moving target. You know, what is, you know, the, you, you all have been the experience of the boss saying, give me the map, give me the map, and, you know, the wrong map. And uh, I was worried about that. I was worried that we wouldn't be able to rise the occasion. So, we, so the opportunity of integrating GIS with planning, you know, was forced upon us from an organizational standpoint. Uh, but it was very, uh, it's, it's a very common sense way to go. So right now we have plans that are very detailed. We're getting more and more detailed. They're, they're 400 to 500, sometimes 600 pages long. The more detailed we, do, we get, the more transportation feasibility analysis we do, uh, the more resource phasing planning we do, the logistics planning we do, the more detailed they are, and that's good. But the Alaska earthquake went off Friday afternoon, and we had to go through a 600-page plan, and it was impossible to get through a 600-page plan in time to execute what you had to execute. What if there was an opportunity to immediately, picture was worth a thousand words, uh, to convey what is the operational concept? What is the concept of operations? Where are our priorities? Where do we need to go in first? Where should we establish our staging bases? The picture tells it. And if we could build the plan visually so that we could immediately communicate and transition the execution, the manner of execution immediately, quickly, uh, that would, that, that's worth uh, the effort. The second thing is uh, when we're, we're walking through courses of action, you know, we, we go through courses of action in a narrative form. Uh, what if we were able to do what the military does when you show visually, you could do COA A up the middle, you can get COA B around the side, and you can COA C up around the bend. Uh, geospatial allows us to be able to do that and visualize and understand what is the impact of gravity of these COAs and what is the value uh, give and take. Uh, the other thing was, you know, the more, the more and more we evolve as emergency management, the more we depend upon the, the geospatial unit leads, uh, the geospatial organizations in the field to do their, their job. Uh, and they have become more and more critical. That's an operational critical mission. It's not a side job. You know, it's not just doing maps as it was, the way it was decades ago. That's a critical mission. That, that's a, it's essential to everything from individual assistance to public assistance to emergency assistance, you name it. Uh, so we need to have the plans have a lot more granular detail to operationalize what we expect that geospatial unit lead to do in the field. Uh, what data they need to collect, what data they need to clean, what are the sources, uh, what is the type of information analysis they're going to have to provide, what type of data analysis might be required, what are your priorities, areas of interest for, for aerial satellite imagery. These are operational requirements that are, that, are, that, are in, that are increasing and deserve their day as a prominent piece of the plan. So we, as we geospatial plan, we're talking about having it visually available, having the data in it, the planning factors of analysis and logistics requirements, data enabled, uh, so we can immediately switch it over into uh, execution. It's interesting, a lot of what you talk about is very much shared and unified across local, state, and federal in terms of that need on the planning side. I was looking at some local and state plans the other day that were also 700 pages long. Um, and so how do you try, and none of them had a map in them. Um, so it was an interesting like, little test to see, because we are gearing up in the third day of NGPS, there's going to be a national geo-enabled planning workshop. So with that, I'm wondering if you can share your vision for what a geo-enabled plan looks like at FEMA and the region as starters, and then we'll talk about you know, how that translates local and state. And I know we've got um, an example of one of your maps, three. So so that's lifelines. We can yeah, get back to that. We'll go back to lifelines. So first of all, there's a couple elements of a, of a geo enabled plan for my mind. First of all, it has to be data enabled. We can't just have narrative pa paragraphs, you know, pages and pages of narrative. That's not that, 
the, the, it's chock full of data in it, but it's not enabled. So we need to have to transition to tabular format, consistent templates and formats. Uh, if the Region 10 Alaska plan is not in the same format as the Region 4 Miami Hurricane plan, then I can't compare and contrast the planning factors. I can't plug that into our Web EOC uh, consequence management forms. I can't easily transfer and, and, and integrate that into a tool to use that data to drive an operational decision making. So the templates of the plans for how the data from anything, from personnel to staging areas to numbers of USAR teams, you name it, has to be in a consistent template format. That's, that's, that's one, and that's kind of, that seems easy, but getting everyone to agree upon a common template is, is very, very hard. Uh, the second thing is the whole plan could be uploaded into a, in a viewer. So the console operations, the geographic constructs, uh, the level of effort to where we need to pl uh, play in each geographic area, the demographics in each area. Uh, if we enable the, the scenarios uh, to drive algorithms on level of capability, then, th then, we, then based upon the actual level of incident or type of incident or epicenter, whatever it may be, it would quickly churn out planning factors for what we might need to immobilize and move. So for example, if, uh, if the surge, if the slosh model for an area, in a geographic area has 300,000 people in the, in the inundation zone, that could drive the amount of meals, it could drive the amount of water, it could drive the amount of personnel disaster survivor system teams we need to convey. Now if that slosh model, the predictive surge model, ends up being much less than that, let's say 50,000, then the algorithms in there would automatically turn down and adjust those requirements. Uh, where the epicenter is based upon the plan uh, is one thing. We always pick the worst pause, plausible worst case scenario for that earthquake. But the epicenter never it turns out to be where we planned it to be. Uh, so we, so we, as long as it's able to, the algorithms are enable us to adjust those planning factors based upon where it is now, where the hazardous run shows now, where the USGS shake, shake map shows now. Uh, that would adjust those planning factors. Because you know, it did take hours, if not half a day or a whole day, to do that manual analysis. And at the end of the day, we're using the same formulas. Uh, so what you see right in front of you is uh, uh, the Magic Seismic Zone. So what we did, we've uh, gone through the process of updating the Magic Seismic Zone plans in regions four, five, six, and seven, uh, lead up for a major exercise, uh, major uh, interagency national exercise next year. What the plans are trying to do, what, the, what, you're trying, what you're seeing, and I can't see what you're doing, feel, feel free to just scroll through it. That's what he's doing, yeah. <laughs> is that it has the scenario uh, in there, and, it, and if you click on each county, each geographic area, you have those planning factors, you have those demographics. And then when the actual hazardous run is done, or when the actual shape map gets, gets loaded to us, and that shape file is uploaded in there, the algorithm, the data planning factors would automatically adjust up or down based upon where that is, and we can adjust down. Adjust down, I mean, I mean that because this is what we think is the worst case. But also, we have the transportation feasibility study analysis in here. And so based upon that analysis, our, our angles of attack, our, our areas of attack, on which address, where we're gonna go in from, where we're gonna have our staging areas, where we're gonna have our reception staging, along with integration and movement locations, our personnel staging locations, they're all established in here for us to go no-go during the incident. So imagine, yep, it just went off, we have a coordination call, and it's, you're sitting on a table, and you say, go, no go, on those staging areas. That's a quick process, as opposed to spending the hours to do crisis action planning mm -hmm. uh, to figure it out as you go. That's exactly the example being shared up here yeah, today. Good. This is for the new magic zone, um, which we'll be talking about more on during Wednesday's workshop as well, and diving more into this. And it's interesting, because all the technology and everything that they're sharing that's a part of this is all commercial, off the shelf, Technology is just innovating how we actually use it and apply it to support the emergency management mission. Now, how do you see, obviously this is a large scale regional um, type scenario that involves multiple FEMA regions. How do you see the same concept translating to support your average local you know, emergency management agency and their, maybe their local fire departments and police agencies? How can they take the same concept? Well. We've been, we, I mean, making the plans more executable, executable usable formats is, goes a long way. Uh, going away from the narratives into checklists, uh, into tables, uh, showing the data up front. What you'll find is that it, uh, it actually, it looks simple, but it actually raises the bar and the level of analysis you gotta do to fill in those blanks uh, and to make sure that you're, you're addressing everything. Uh, we use, uh, we use uh, uh, dashboards, Esri-based uh, platforms uh, for, for all of our incidents 
it doesn't have to be the, large, the, the biggest large scale instance. As long as you have those algorithms in there, so you can adjust up and down uh, uh, based on where, where it goes. Uh, from a planning perspective, integrating with the GS community is, 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 tr is tremendous. We're having a workshop here on Wednesday uh, with, with that group. We've had the, uh, uh, we've, we've been increasingly doing that more and more. Uh, the reason why that's so important is because we, you know, one challenge you're always going to have is having leadership buy-in on the use of these technologies, use of these tools. You need to get their buy-in from the beginning. You need to have them understanding and familiar with the processes, familiar with the tools, and have confidence in it uh, during the steady state as you're planning, as you're socializing, as you're briefing. And so when the actual incident occurs, they, you want them to say, give me my dashboard. What does the algorithm show? What does the, what does the, the viewer show us? Let's see that. Let's, let's put that on the table. Uh, but you have to get their buy-in. You have to familiarize that during the steady state during the planning process. So you started to touch on some of the challenges, but what, is, what has been your greatest challenge in fostering this shift to geo-enabled plans? What kind of challenges have you faced? Well, the big thing is the buy-in. Um, you know, we have 10 FEMA regions. You have headquarters. You have you know, no incidents identical. Uh, all, the, all of our communities are different. All the states who we support are different. And having that common understanding, common template is really a, t a tough sell. Uh, you don't want to stifle innovation and creativity, but at the same time, you want to have consistency and be able to execute in a consistent fashion. And you want one team that's, that's traveling from one region to another to be able to know where to access and how to access the tools. So we need to have, so, so the middle ground was, uh, let's do the common template and organization, but let's not stifle creativity by uh, allowing the six-step planning process to come up with the, state, the, right, the mission, the requirements, the kinds of operations that, you, that are unique to your situation, unique to your requirements. Uh, from a leadership buy-in perspective, uh, you, using these tools, having confidence in these tools is really, really hard. Uh, it, it, we did it for years before we got real good buy-in, and the kicker was the declaration process. It wasn't until we used the modeling to, to help expedite individual assistance declarations for a state then our most senior leadership and political leadership start to understand, oh, wow, this is, this is really great. This is useful. How else can I use it? How else can I use it? Uh, and then we start getting questions about the level of confidence. And, and, under, and as you walk through them through that, they will understand and appreciate it. Uh, sometimes you just have to have the viewer up on the screen, have them, everyone see it and refer to it, and then they'll, they'll start uh, by, uh, by word of mouth and, 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 and other people talking about it. They'll actually want to see it more and be acclimated more and, and use it more and more. Uh, so so that's, a, that's, the, that's probably the biggest challenge. And taking kind of what you've learned through the process of doing that within FEMA, what do you think needs to happen to inspire and institutionalize change in the planning process nationwide, kind of across all levels of government? Use of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, again, that's why you have to make it usable. I mean, right. the, it's a chicken egg problem. Uh, some, most, most people say they don't want to use the plan because it's not usable, it's hard to read. Uh, but then you don't get that feedback, you don't get their involvement in the process until they, until they use it, so it's a chicken egg problem. Um, data sharing and integration is our next big hurdle we need to work on together. Uh, when we have, a view, I think of a viewer, you have a transportation uh, energy viewer. So we, or, we organize ourselves by lifelines. Um, energy, transportation, uh, public health and medical, hazardous materials, you name it. There's seven critical lifelines and the critical lifelines helped us organize and focus our attention to those key things we need to focus on. Uh, and then the viewers, the use of geospatial technologies in the viewers that you're seeing behind me uh, was the logical next step because what, give me some context, how bad is bad? You know, why is it green? Why is it yellow? Why is it red? Uh, get, you know, the lifeline is able to focus, enable us to focus our attention into those key areas, those key critical information uh, elements, and then that helped us focus on what to, what to address geospatially uh, in the viewer technology. Uh, these geospatial viewers, when we say yellow in the, in the situational report, it's the viewer that gives the context and the thousand words to help them understand and appreciate how bad it is. Uh, this is live, so you're not going to. So everything looks green. But when you zoomed in on Tallahassee and Bay County, you would see where gas was, and you would be able to see where retail gas was not. You'd be able to see kind of.
context what ports were open, what's were, what were not. The level of fuel consumption. In the, from the business outage perspective, partnership with the private sector, we were able to show the relative uh, lack of busyness you know, amongst our retail centers, any retail center, uh, in partnership with Google, uh, compared to what it normally was. And that gives you the context on whether we're stable or not. That gives you context of whether we're, we're on path to be stable. Uh, showing the viewer and having that up, that's what helped get the buy-in, I think, from our most senior leadership. And now, we're, now I get the question, the, the, now the question today is not, is this accurate? Right. Or how did you do this? Now the question is, what else could we build? Mm -hmm. you know, give me the viewer for public health medical. Give me the viewer for hazardous material. Mm -hmm. And so our next big challenge is going to be our transportation, uh, I mean, our, our, uh, our transparency and sharing of that data. So for example, transportation is easy. You know, we have ways, we have crowdsourcing, we have all kinds of, of data that's freely available and, and, and useful. But communications is more difficult. Uh, I'll give you an example. I have, I, can, I know from a steady state what is the propagation of signal across our communities, but I can't tell how that's adjusted down during an incident when there's impact, mostly because of proprietary information. Uh, hazardous mat material, uh, a lot of that, that information is, is, uh, is held behind uh, for official use only uh, platforms. Uh, hospital data is not really f freely shared uh, until the big disaster happens and then we are able to access that. But th the ability to access and tra transfer and share uh, our, this data to do these dashboards uh, across all of our infrastructure sectors, that's our next biggest hurdle uh, that we need to address. So that, that's pretty interesting in terms of most of these dashboards were developed during recent events. So it's, you know, putting out something like a 70% solution, seeing how they gravitate towards it and getting them to institutionalize it in the process. Uh, so you started to introduce this concept of re response lifelines. You started to talk about it a little bit. I know some of the participants participated in a session this morning that also talked about it and how Florida used and implemented the response lifelines during our recent disasters this year. Um, but we'd like to dive into that a little bit more and hoping that you can share a bit about the concept here and how that's helping to reduce complexity within FEMA and to the whole community. Yeah, so we've been, uh, if, you, if, if you were around during our, our disasters a few years ago uh, and you saw our senior leadership brief, it was a 10 to 20 page Word document of bullets uh, organized by areas of the country, regions, and uh, uh, ESF, our emergency support functions. And it was, you know, you read it, a senior leader would read it and they would come away and say, well, how bad is it? Is this bad? I don't know. I can't tell. There's a lot of words here. We're doing a lot. Right? There's a lot of activities in here, but how, how bad is bad? How bad is it? And we, we had trouble conveying that. Uh, what the lifelines were able to do was give that context. Give the what, so what, and now what, based upon these impacts. Give me a, give me a pulse check on whether we're stable or not. In other words, what does stable mean? It's subjective. Uh, stable means we have the plans and resources in place or about to be employed or employed to manage the risk on, in hand. It's not that you could be green and stable and have impact. You could have green and stable and be actively responding, but you're able to manage the risks. That means you're stable. Uh, yellow means you're, you have the resources in place. Uh, you're not yet employed. They're not yet being managed, but you will be there soon uh, within 72 hours, normally, or 48 hours. Red is there's a critical obstacle in your way. You cannot deploy the resources. You don't have the resources. It's, you know, the life-saving missions are so dire or the safety to our responders and the survivors is still too great where we're, we're, we're that red. Uh, and so it helped to provide our leadership with that context of where to focus and where not to focus. Uh, a great example was uh, uh, Typhoon, uh, Typhoon uh, uh, U2, uh, where community, you know, the PSAP was out and the switching stations were out. And we've, it's not the first time that that's, you know, those have been out. But they were red for obvious reasons because they had a direct impact to, to life safety. We didn't have a viable solution to, to, to stabilize those. Well, immediately, our leadership skimmed over all the greens and, and focused on that. Well, in the old way of doing business, that would have been buried under pages and pages of activity. And, not, and, and the, the squeaky wheel would have gotten the, the oil. You know, the, you know. But this brings us to that logically and brings our attention to where it's needed most and it helps us to avoid spinning our wheels where it's not. 
The other thing it does, it really helps enable a really frank conversation amongst us at all levels on are we okay? So if, if the state, let's say a state says they're red in an area uh, and we think they're, they're stable, well, we now have a very intelligent conversation back and forth on the merits, on, on how bad is bad, where we need to focus our attention, what do we need to do to get that to green. Mm -hmm. uh, so it forced us that, that debate. It forced that conversation at a very operational level. Uh, while before, it was, we got data, we, we, we reworded the data, and we conveyed the data. Uh, so now we we're really able to have a really good, frank, and honest and, uh, conversation, the negotiation sometimes of what do we need to focus on and, uh, and how, where, where our attention is needed the most. It's, you're in a unique position where you're rolling something out new, response lifelines, and you've already had a chance to actually implement them in recent disasters, which is a nice opportunity as opposed to inventing and waiting to see what happens. But how would you anticipate drawing off of what you learned in FEMA during the typhoon and then the two hurricanes and even the wildfires? How would you anticipate that these response lifelines will be used by local state and tribal agencies and as well as some of our NGO partners? What does that mean? So first of all, if it's Florida and Georgia and North Carolina and South Carolina and Hawaii and, and CNMI and Guam in the room and California, I, I always have to give you my apologies because we're, you know, we're notorious for building the airplane while flying it and changing things in midstream. Uh, but we, you know, it worked out well and uh, your partnership has been instrumental in this. Uh, so, we, uh, we, first of all, we're going to be doing a lot of training. We, we actually planned to do a lot of training and rollouts. Uh, we've, you know, we'll, we'll be addressing the, the, the regional interagency steering committee meetings, the risk meetings. Uh, we're, we're, we're applying some state-specific training where needed. Uh, and then during the disaster, if we have noticed, we will send folks out to your state and to your region uh, to help educate you on the templates and use, uh, uh, so, you, so you're acclimated to it and understandable, understandable of it. And then for a no notice like Alaska, uh, we'll, send, we'll, we'll do our best to walk you through it and we'll be flexible along the way. We're also working at adjusting our situational awareness viewers and data collection instruments. So we use WebESC pretty heavily. Uh, in WebESC, our SITREP, instead of just being a blank field where you just sh throw information, you actually have a database behind it. And so the critical information requirements for each of the lifeline and the critical elements of each lifeline with flexibility, we'll be there to be able to collect that and use that to help shape where the information is. And it's okay to be gray, which is no, no data. It's okay to be blank well, where there's no impact. Uh, and so uh, the, the more and more we share that and, and, and provide access to that and, and utilize that uh, will help enable that uh, to be transitioned. Um, we're gonna be adopted in our exercises. Uh, we have, our, like I mentioned, Imagine coming up next year. Um, uh, and we'll use every opportunity we have uh, to, to, uh, to institutionalize it. A couple areas that come up uh, that we need to adjust is what is stabilized. I gave you a definition, it's still open for debate. Who determines the color? Who determines if we're stabilized? The state or the federal coordinating officer for the incident or the, or the or headquarters? This is always a good conversation. Right now, we're, we're at the opinion of the incident. Uh, the federal coordinating officer in coordination with the state is where the designation of where that is at rest to speak on behalf of the incident area as opposed to a regional headquarters view, which will always be very different. Um, I forgot where I was going to go from there. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, and then the other question I have is, uh, uh, you know, what is its relation with court capabilities? What's its relation to emergency support functions? And my answer to that is, we still execute by the programs that we're authorized. We still execute by the lead federal agencies and departments and agencies that we're, that we're organized by. We still execute by emergency support function. Uh, which the authorities and coordination mechanisms to, to be operational. Uh, but the lifelines enables us to assess the, the situation, uh, drive our incident objectives, and prioritize our, our attention and how we communicate to how bad is bad and how well we're performing based upon those objectives. Uh, the core capabilities has been our, is, a, is a national interoperable means of communicating on the level of capability we need to build to uh, that's interoperable across jurisdictions has been well socialized and where we need to build and where we need to continue to invest in. Uh, so that's how I, I demark those, those different uh, preparedness functions. Thank you, because uh, actually in the exercise tomorrow, it's aligned to the core capabilities, but they'll also be exercising to this new concept of the response lifeline. So this is a really helpful background. And we do have Dan Alexander with um, FEMA's preparedness division joining us tomorrow. He'll go into more on the NRF revision as well. 
which is the National Response Framework. So kind of shifting gears and, and going back to your original thread around uh, the, the, um, the flooding events that kind of got you onto geospatial to begin with. Uh, we have a lot of folks joined with us today that are obviously already very passionate about public safety and also technology and are in, to one degree or another are kind of agents of change. Um, and obviously, I'm sure you've experienced quite a bit um, in your career, but if you were to facilitate, say, an intervention um, with your senior leaders on, on GIS and embracing and harnessing the power of technology, what would be your message to them? So emerging, man like I talked about emerging managers and, their, and how great of a mission is. Um, one value that they have uh, that they share with the geospatial community is change. We're, you know, we're the most self-critical, you know, professions I've ever seen. You know, we, we do an AAR, and we'll just we'll just critique everything, and we'll t we'll, we'll we'll hammer ourselves on where we could have done better, and where we messed up, and where we should have gone faster. We're we're too we're almost too too critical from that perspective. Uh, but the value of that is we're constantly looking for ways to evolve and mature and change and adjust and and roll with the punches or roll with the risk and, and keep ahead of the risk and cheat the risk and get ahead of it. The geospatial community is, is very similar. Uh, you know, the IT technology is constantly, constantly changing. The private sector is way ahead of us. and We're always trying to race to catch up. Uh, the information age, uh, the use of AI and machine learning technologies, is just, it's just, you know, we're just racing to catch up. There's so many opportunities there. So when emergency management is looking to for find agents of change and for evolutions and closing gaps and capability, the geospatial community is right there and willing to adjust and very malleable and very adjustable and very, and very forward leaning and open to adjustments. I've never seen a community more open to adjustments. And then the coordination across the community. So when you look upon the geos community, uh, you know, region one through 10, uh, across the states, across our private sector partners, our, our, our voluntary organizations, uh, you know, they, f they freely share information, ideas, and, and lessons learned. And so they are, an eight, they are a vehicle uh, to affect adjustment and, and, and address priorities. And if you, if you get started, some, I, I've seen if you get a change started in the geospatial community, it, it just spreads like instantaneous uh, because they are so networked. Uh, they depend upon, they all depend upon each other to operate so much that that change and that involvement and that adjustment happens very quickly. Um, and so senior leadership and emergency management level or any other level should embrace that and use that as a vehicle to, to, for, to, to carry on and address their priorities and their agenda. Great. And what is kind of one thing that you would like to sh kind of leave this audience with and all the participants with to take with them over the course of the next you know, two and a half days based on, you know, we, response lifelines, geo enabling the plans, challenges in getting the adoption of technology. All of these things have been a part of your career in the recent past. So what would be that most critical? So that last point, you know, the, the culture of this community to constantly evolve, uh, improve upon themselves, uh, share information and work in a network capacity, that's a core value that's rare. It really is. Uh, it's extremely efficient. Uh, hold on to that. Always embrace that. You know, I, I see one of it, you know, another challenge I thought, you know, it's a good challenge I have is, I, I call it race to the top. You know, and the, we always hear race to the bottom. But you know, this community race to the top. We're always running to get ahead and to do the next thing and impress the other group. And look what I did, you know, look, look, the, look what I built. And I built this viewer, isn't that so cool? And we use that. And we steal upon each other and we leverage these things. Keep that culture, you know, keep that. Uh, you know, the moment we, we, we shy away from that, the moment this community uh, you know, moves away from that, it'll be the death knell of it. Uh, we're, this, you're, this community is strong and this function is strong because your willingness and ability to share information. Uh, you know, in these disasters, we've had, man, what a disaster season we've had in 2018. We thought 2017 was bad. There was one, there was one time where we had uh, four, five major disasters in the early phase response phase going on in six regions and two hemispheres the same week. And, you know, we were all, in, we were all working uh, virtually to support each other. And 
the Region 8, the, the Region 8 folks were, work, were, were supporting Florence, and then, then the next day pivoting to support uh, Typhoon Mangut, the next day pivoting to support uh, Michael. And uh, that, that, that value, that core value that you have, you need to retain that and use it. Uh, promulgate it, share it, socialize it. You know, I want you to, the rest of the functions and, and, and missions and disciplines to understand that and use that because they will embrace you and bring you in uh, more and more. And so uh, be proud of yourselves. Thank you so much for your commitment and support uh, to us. Uh, we'll always be there for, uh, for you uh, when it comes to information sharing and transparency. Uh, and let's hold ourselves to that high standard. Well, Josh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.